today, Jacob is buried in Canaan before his sons begin to worry about Joseph. Now that their father is dead, Joseph has a new opportunity for revenge on The Bible Brief. The sons of Israel are in mourning. After that final day of blessing, where Jacob told his sons what would happen to their tribes in the end of days, after those blessings, Jacob took his final breath and died, joining Abraham and Isaac in death and instructing that his body be buried with theirs in the land of Canaan. Jacob's 12 sons would abide by their father's final command. They would bury his body in the land of Canaan that land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. They would bury him in the cave that Abraham bought generations prior for a burial place for Sarah, that first portion of the promised land actually owned by one of the national fathers. As we begin reading today, we come back to the brothers as they're mourning the recent death of their father. Let's read starting in Genesis 50. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the final days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If I have now found favor in your eyes... Please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, then I will return. The Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. The narrative here is focused specifically on Joseph, as he mourns his father's death. Instead of all the brothers, were simply invited to see Joseph's response. And Joseph, being the prime minister of Egypt, with all the privileges of the office, makes no little thing of Jacob's death. First, he has Jacob embalmed, which may have included mummification, in a process that took 40 days to dry Jacob's body before additional burial preparations were made over the subsequent 30 days. In Egypt, Jacob is mourned and prepared for burial for a total of 70 days. But that's not the end of the process. After that 70 days, Joseph requests leave from Pharaoh to go back to Canaan to bury his father. He's going to bury him in the cave of Machpelah, just as he had sworn to do. Pharaoh readily grants this leave to Joseph, and quite the entourage goes up with Joseph to bury Jacob. So Joseph went to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lament, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore the place was called Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. After seventy days of mourning in Egypt and a trip to Canaan, the great caravan that went with Joseph and the brothers to bury Jacob mourns again for seven days. Further, as the Canaanites look upon the mourners, they're so affected by it that they actually name the place where they mourned to commemorate the event. It's worth noting here the relationship that the people of Israel and the Egyptians have with one another. It appears to be a friendly relationship with real affection on both sides. The Egyptians truly mourned alongside the Israelites as their patriarch was preparing to be laid to rest. They had experienced the blessings of Jacob and Jacob's family, and they were paying their respects to the father of the man who had saved much of the world from starvation. We should take special note of this relationship between Egypt and the Israelites because of something that soon happens in the Bible story. 
this special relationship eventually breaks down. But that's for another episode. As the people enter the land of Canaan, we see the final burial place for Jacob. In the cave of Machpelah, he is laid to rest by the bodies and bones of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and his own wife, Leah. A cave that's a sort of time capsule with the people of the promise of God. We read this. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. In the Bible, the story of Jacob has ended. But the ramifications of his death begin to dawn on the brothers of Joseph. Almost as soon as his body is buried, they begin to fear that an old score may yet be settled. Perhaps Joseph had bided his time for vengeance to wait until his father was dead and gone. Perhaps now would be the time when they would be punished for selling him into slavery so many years prior. Next we read this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. We can see the brothers here preempting any action on Joseph's part. They are hoping that they can gain forgiveness from their brother before he exacts vengeance on their sin. And first, they appeal to a command that supposedly comes from their father Jacob that Joseph should forgive his brothers. But they don't stop with that. They also collectively appeal to being servants of God. And this is despite the historical unrighteousness of the brothers. They're now appealing to being servants of God and ask Joseph to forgive them. And finally, they fall down before Joseph, saying that they are Joseph's servants as well. You can almost feel their fear and trepidation before their prime minister brother. His reaction, however, is not one of aggression, but of tenderness. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. As Joseph weeps and comforts his brothers, he speaks some of the most famous words found in the book of Genesis. He says, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. Joseph appeals to the mysterious fact that God used the wicked choice of the brothers to sell Joseph into slavery and turned their intention for evil into a good and righteous result. After all, God raised up the prisoner slave Joseph to be the very prime minister of Egypt to lead the nation through the awful famine. The single action of selling Joseph into slavery had two contrasting intentions. An evil intention by the brothers that was co-opted by God into his good intentions to save many from starvation. Joseph does not take vengeance on his brothers, because he understands that vengeance is for God to carry out, not for him. Joseph leaves it up to God to settle old scores, and instead he comforts and speaks kindly to his brothers. Joseph has returned the evil of his brothers with goodness and kindness a victory over his brothers, achieved through faith in God. After this scene of catharsis amongst the brothers, the book of Genesis closes with the final days of Joseph, which includes an important forward-looking statement for the nation. We read this. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. 
And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being one hundred and ten years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph's final words are less about him than about God. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. Despite their current status away from their homeland, God has not forgotten his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He's not forgotten the promise of the land of Canaan, seed in abundance, and a blessing to the world. He has not forgotten. This would be a message that would become words to hold on to for future generations. Generations who would never know Abraham, the man of faith. Who would never know Isaac, the son of the promise. Who would never know Jacob, that blessed struggler. They would never know Joseph and hear from his mouth the amazing works that God had accomplished through him. These fathers would become memories and history for the budding nation of Israel. Memories passed from generation to generation. But they were not just memories. They were hope for the future. Hope for the fulfillment of the great promises of God. The great promise that one day God would indeed bring back his people up from Egypt to once again tread on the ground of their fathers. Someday they would be back in the land of Canaan. And just as God worked history for Joseph to save people, he will work history again to bring his people out of Egypt. God will accomplish a great deliverance because no matter how much time passes, God does not forget his promises. But this great deliverance will begin with forgetting. A forgetting that will spell destruction upon Egypt. The Egyptians forget about Joseph, and they forget about Joseph's God. Soon we read, there arose a new Pharaoh in Egypt who did not know Joseph. And that Pharaoh begins a campaign of oppression. Oppression that sets the stage for God's great deliverance in the Exodus. Join us next time as we review the book of Genesis before launching into the story of the great deliverance of God. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023.